because that's yeah. held down with the veneer tape on the front. So now, what oh, we'll, you got veneer tape. That's what yeah, put veneer tape on the front. Uh, doing is pressing it down on the uh, lines. <clears throat> so you put veneer tape there. Yeah. You, you know, this is easy to use another sheet of that. Uh, no, it, 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 that uh, sticky stuff doesn't have a long enough, doesn't have good adhesive, it'll come off. Yeah. The veneer tape really holds it, so you got to have something to really hold it. And all these little spots where we didn't get a very good fill around this uh, shield, this stuff will fill it right in. That's what we need to get the coverage. And we're trying to fill it away. Yeah. And we anticipate making some powder rays put over the top. Could be. Or yeah, something just like that. Even, even when you do bounding and stuff, you always have to load the axe. Put some of that stuff in. Is it hard? Yeah, it'll hard. And you could sand it. Oh yeah. We're gonna sand, we're gonna let it dry a little bit and in a little while we're gonna sand it. It is. Neutral color. But it's nice and black. Yeah. Yeah, but they yeah, but they don't have those colors. They just have a natural. When you do this, what is that? Three days. Exactly right. a little bit of that. Well, I hate that that, never see it. that that shield is so much thicker than the other. That's not good. Yeah. Oh, it's not it's not normally that way. No, no. No, no the shield should be exactly yeah. the same thickness as everything else. Yeah. Yeah. But I didn't make it ahead of time like I should have. I should have come in and made one ahead of time. Like it. It's all it's all I guess you just have to work line. real quick for it. <laughs> yeah, it's so lacking. Sorry. I save all my ebony dust. I got it in a little tin. Well, I tell you, if you make something out of ebony, it is a problem because yeah. it, the ebony dust gets into white wood. You've got yeah, white ebony. It, it just yeah. makes yeah. a mess. It's better to put a coat of shellac on, on it before you start messing with yeah. the sand and the ebony. All this stuff I know that you're supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> I get impatient when I get to that point. Yeah, do that way too. It's hard, hard to get out. Yeah. See how it's cooled up right there. I saw a video of a guy using denatured alcohol and just going over a piece. And I don't know how many times he did it, but it, it had to be at least ten times to get it to stack the duke dust out. But then you can't sand it anymore unless you put a sanding sealer or something over the top of it. I'm going to clamp this down on something because that, that shield being too big is just causing all kinds of problems. But we can fix it. Is there any... Uh, oh, yes, I'm going to go somewhere. Any piece of wax paper? Yes, yeah, but I don't see... You want parchment? You want parchment paper? Yeah, parchment paper. something glue on it.
said it was just a paper on the top of the back when I glued it. I just I put wax on the surface. But when I put it on top of it, I like I just I took a like a, a little strip of wood about you know like it was real thin and I just waxed it. I put it laid it over the top of my seam and then put a bunch of stuff over the top of it and just do it right off. No, because I had to sand. I had to sand the glue. You know, when the glue came out, I had to sand all that off. But no, the wax is on. The wax is on the other, other piece of wood, and it didn't transfer. But it didn't stick. It all down to another piece of veneer to make it make this thicker but we don't have another piece of veneer so I'm going to glue it down to this piece of 1 16th of wire. Do you, do you try to take any of the, the black stuff off? Oh yeah I'm going to let it dry a little bit and just just scuff it up that didn't take much off of it. Ah, that gum that thing being tall like that just sick. It's got everything screwed up. This is poked up how it's supposed to be. I can't get it to lay down. I don't know what this is going to look like when you get through. See, that's, that's sticking up. There it goes. There. Black will fill in that hole right there. Is it possible to do the black from the other side if you were? Yeah, you can, but you, you, you'd have to sand it all off. Right. I mean, if, you, if you ended up with a piece that still had a little pull. Oh, yeah. yeah. In fact, we're going to do the eye that way. Oh, we're, going, okay. we're going to do the eye on the, on the other side. This uh, black stuff water soluble, so it will melt right into the building. Jeff, remember, he was playing around with different things he could mix up to make dots or position dots. Mm -hmm. He took uh, the blue chalk that you get, you know, like for. Bring it in. and mixed it with, with glue and it it came out looking good. You fill the dots with that. I remember if you did you use super glue or just regular glue? Well uh we just did that those blue dots using that blue chalk. Oh I don't know. I'm a little bit confused here. You're gonna glue that down. Yeah. Well that's this that's is the show the permanent right? this is the yeah it, that would normally be a piece of veneer. Okay. And, and if I would have it with the grain, the grain this was going this way, I would have the veneer piece with grain going that way. So in this particular case, you're not going to sand that black stuff off? No, it, I don't have to. You don't have to because it's water soluble so far. Right. 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 Right.
few claims. Okay, I'm going to get some F-style claims. Yeah, two or three of them. You want to use something like this? Uh, yeah, I'll use that over here. Here's our F-plan. It's just started. Yeah, I can. Just use a few bench hooks if you want. What if we bring this whole thing to the middle and use some bench hooks across? Oh, yeah, we can do that. We can do that. That's right. I have a couple of landers. I don't know how tight it'll be, but these get pretty tight. Yeah. So you think the rubber gives it enough give to Makes take care of it? It should take care of, take care care of that, that uh, mismatch. Yeah, okay. that's where you use that rubber. Where do you get that material? The well, I get it at uh, um, Sears has it. Oh, no, not Sears anymore. But Deep, Home Depot and all those places have it. It's a toolbox shelf liner. Okay. okay. It looks kind of like it would be that kind that goes in underneath the shower too. When you're making a shower, yeah, you could use an any kind of rubberized. Yeah. 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 All right, we're gonna let that we're gonna let that dry. Or you can get the stuff that got sticky back there. Yeah. 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 It's not as resilient as that, but it's two millimeters thick, and I have a bunch of them. Yeah. So you can just lay them up there. I'm to roll the craft foam. Craft foam. That's what I call silly wings. Is the brand. I tell you what worked really good too is. uh Quarter inch thick foam insulation. You know that you get at uh, Home Depot and places like that. It's in it's in a it's in a you can't buy a little bit. It's in a two foot or four foot cut. And it's in a pack. You got to buy like ten sheets at once. That stuff really works because it deforms so good and it's uh, you know quarter inch cl uh, closed density foam and it's orange color. I use, I've got a sheet of it at home. I use that a lot. It, it works really well. I went to buy some more the other day and they wouldn't sell me a sheet. They said they have to sell you the whole pack. The whole pack's like $40. I didn't need that. Okay, well, while that's done, uh, we will look at a corner fan. Can you ever show us how to make that black with water molding? Uh, yeah, we're going to do that. Look at that now. We're going to do that. Uh, we talked a little bit yesterday about bandings. The, uh, if you want to know how to make bandings, you need to get Steve Bolatta's DVDs on bandings. They'll tell you every, that's where I learned to do it, tell you everything you need to know. That is, uh, Sells it in. Uh, there's two volumes. Volume one is basic. Volume two is advanced. Show you how to make every kind of banding. Uh, you do need some uh, specially special jigs, which are easy to make. You can cut them out. You can cut the little pieces by hand, or you can cut them on a saw, a band saw, or on that little. Remember, you're showing that little table saw that I've got. It uses a little seven and a quarter inch blade. I, that's where I cut everything on. It's just a matter of cutting up a bunch of pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, passed this one around yesterday. I made this one this last week, and I brought some parts that I used to make that. Okay. That's made out of a uh, Dyed veneer. 
I get from B and B rare woods and veneers. It's on your list. B and B rare woods and veneers. You can get yellow, blue, red. Get all colors. You start out by making packets. Um, the elements of this little ice. The elements of this little banding is in this book. This is where I got the idea of making. Right here. So uh, you need a one inch, you need some one inch packets of uh, blue, yellow, blue, and you need some uh, quarter inch packets of yellow, blue, yellow, and you need some one eighth packets of blue, red, blue. So you start out by gluing them together. You just glue these sheets of veneer together, and there's blue, yellow, blue. And there is blue, red, blue. And here is the uh, blue, yellow, blue, and blue, yellow, blue. That's the same. Oh, here's the one. Yellow, blue, yellow. And you, once you get these packets glued together, and I glue them in two inch strips. And the reason I make them in two inch strips is because when you get ready to glue all this together, you have a U shaped frame made out of plywood lined with packing tape that you'll lay these elements in, put another board across the top, use a bunch of clamps like this and clamp it all together. But to start with, you, you, you make these little packets and then you cut them to the right length and you come up with all these little pieces like this. And then it's a matter of fitting them together. So I'm gonna use, I guess that sticky tape, that stuff. this together. Let me just have to read and see what I'm doing. I'll these parts of it. Let me set that right over there. There we go. Anywhere in there. Okay. Now to start with, uh, I'm going to put the core together. And I'll need a straight edge. Straight edge on here. And now we're ready to assemble. Back up this way a little bit. There you go. We start off with the one inch piece. Put it on there. Stick it down. The next one is a yellow, blue, yellow one. It goes there next to it. Stick it down. Then we got the red, blue, red, blue. Put it in there. To get now, and the yellow, another yellow one, and there's the pattern right there, and we repeat. And you can see we're making the pattern. I usually make bandings either 24 or 36. This one I made, I think 24 or 36 maybe. Yeah. That's probably, what, 30? 30. Yeah. So once you get this done, uh, the, next, the next one that goes in here, I would lay, because this paper's only so long, just stick another piece on it like that, keep on going. So you get one of these things this long, it's like a snake. And uh, it's held together with the sticky tape on the, with the sticky paper on the back. Then you have to make the banding that holds it on the top, which in this case is a black white, isn't it? 
continuous black white. And he makes those by gluing together black and white veneer. That's this right here. Take a two inch strip of black veneer, two inch strip of white veneer, put them in the press, glue them together, cut them into two, strip, two inch wide strip, apply glue on the top of this, put your cover on it, put it in the press, let it dry, take it out, peel the tape off the back, do the same thing on the other side. You use that same white glue? Use, same, use white glue. Use white glue. And I use a little small paint roller to roll it on there. And that's it. That's all you gotta do. Put it together and let, let it dry in the clamps and then just whack it off. And I cut it off with a bandsaw. I used to use my, that little 1 16th inch blade. It takes, you know, this is deer. When you get this thing made, you don't want to waste any of it. So I have a bandsaw blade that's uh, I think it's a 16 tooth. It's, it's real fine cutting and it's a metal cutting blade. So it had, doesn't have much set in it. And that way you don't have a big curve. And you just feed it across the bandsaw and you come up with a pack of uh, veneers. Here's another. Another can you, and, and all this, all this construction is the same way. And this one, this one's made, this one's made just like that one. It's just got different packs. You got those little packs. And you start off cutting them out of something this big. You know, everybody thinks you cut this little tiny pieces. No, glue all that together and you can just cut them off. So those tiny pieces of that just set them in? Yeah. <clears throat> See this one, these little tiny pieces in here were, were in, out of a log this wide. You just cut them off. Now, these pieces here, if you lay down, you made that ahead of time. Yeah, you make this. This is the first thing you do. You make this ahead of time. Okay. And well, you cut those off. Describe the press you're using. To... Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the press. Yeah, it's in, it's in there in that uh, video, but I'll show you what it is. It's real simple. It's just a... Uh, a U-shaped trough made out of three-quarter plywood. Looking at look at it end on. And this is three-quarter plywood. Distance in here is two inches plus, and it can be any length. Uh, I just screw this together. I just screw those and holds it like that. Inside is lined with packing tape to keep glue from sticking to it. So you lay your pack in there on top of it. You use a piece of, I use a piece of oak that's two inches, and it needs to be thick, about like an inch and a half. That will lay in here on top of your packet. And then you use clamps like that to clamp it all along. And uh, to clamp it, you got your, got your box laid up like this. And your packets laying in here. And I put a two by four up under here to keep it up off the bench. And then clamp. Lots of clamps. Yeah, use these clamps like this. And the reason it's up on the two by four is I can put the bottom of the clamp up under there. Just tighten it down. And I use a bunch of clamps. On this, I use, I should probably use 15 clamps. And that big thick piece on top distributes distributes the pressure just fine. I have never used a rubber in there. I just used. Why don't you go from here to here? On the table saw. Table saw. Table saw. Yep. And you mm -hmm. set up a sled or something. Yep. Yep. Set up a sled. You can do it on a bandsaw. Uh, 
But I found that the bandsaw leaves a fuzz, mm -hmm. and the table saw works a little a little better. Th this one I did on the bandsaw. Use your real thin turf blade. Yeah. Okay. And a stop. You know, sand on it. Oh, sand. Yes, absolutely. Now, I just stuck those together. But if I was making this for reading, the first thing I'd do is knock that knock that burr off. Just hitting these little. In fact, this is what I use. You see that fuzz it makes? It only be fuzzed on one side. The top's clean, bottom's fuzzy. Knock that burr off. That fuzz off and put them together. And you glue even the smaller packets the same way. Yep. Yep. You don't need. You don't absolutely need to glue in between each one of these. And the reason you don't need to glue in between each one of these is because the black white that you can put on top glues them all together. So you don't have to do that. Now Lava's video shows some things that he does that he, that he puts together that way. Now, there are all kinds of ways that you can uh, make other patterns using, using this method. And here's some of them. The uh, cover veneers, the black, white veneers, all, that's, that's, the process is the same always. What changes is how you make these packets. So you can glue up, in this case, uh, this is, yeah, red cedar and maple. So the only table saw, cut it to 45 degree angle. And you get a pack that looks like this. Now, and then you put them together. Back, back, and it'll make a chevron, chevron band. Here's the pack that you looked at before for the little bands. Wipe those off. There's another one for a different size. Uh, got an ebony in there somewhere. There's a there's a. These are just scraps that came off the ends. Yeah, remember that uh, barber pole bandy, same way. And you would have a, you have a little piece like this, but it'd be black and white. Stick it on there. Just keep going. Nothing complicated about it at all. Now there are some more difficult ones to make that are uh, like diamonds where you've got diamonds in there. Mm -hmm. Now those you have to cut on a bandsaw and you, you have a you have one cut this way and one cut the opposite way. So, so there's a diamond pattern right there, that way. And then that has to be cut on a different angle and it shows that how to do this in the band in the video. So you've got these little blocks with the diamond on them. And you can change the diamond size from from being uh, symmetrical to being a long diamond or a short diamond, you do that by changing the angle that you cut them with. I won't, won't try to go into all that. This that would have been cut off of there. Yeah. There's two pieces of it, and they're stuck together. Not hard to do at all. And also, you can make in, uh, in a face grain band, which is this stuff right here. This is mahogany black white veneer. That's a piece of my, so suppose this is mahogany. You want this to be face grain. So this is the face you want, you don't want this grain. So you cut a two inch piece this way. Stick those together, put the top on. So you'd have one two inches wide, face grain here, just butt them together and lay the and lay the uh, cover veneers on it. And when you cut it, you get a nice figure. Like how this many, one. How so many strips can you get out of one of these two inch? Probably eight or 10. And uh, when you get down toward the end, like uh, this one, you don't want to waste it. So you glue a piece of plywood on it. See, there's the packet. Now you can cut all the way down to nothing. Not wasting it. That's that's made with those drills. You remember we looked at the drill and plug cutter yesterday? 
like this, mm -hmm. do the setup on a drill press. Once you get the drill press set up, you've got this, you've got the core made. You're gonna come back, you're gonna drill those holes. Those holes gotta be straight, absolutely straight, right in the middle. So you make a scrap, get it all set up, adjust everything till you get it set up just right, and then just go down through there and cut those, cut those, uh, drill those holes, and then stick the plug in them. And I was limited to the depth of this by the depth of the plug I could make. I could only make a seven eighths inch plug, so I can't have a strip more than seven eighths inch wide for this particular design. Here's another one, another variation. This is lace wood. It's like this one, made the same way. But it's got a different cover, cover veneer, and you can vary the thicknesses of the cover veneers. So there's a thick white and a thin black. And this is a thick black and a thin white. So you can vary the look of it just by changing the veneers. This is a very popular uh, uh, banding for chest of drawers. We run around the bottom of a chest of drawers, they would use this. This is pretty big. That is, that is the right size right there. Now, let's talk about how you inlay that. You can't be lucky enough that you're gonna make that thing exactly a quarter of an inch, so a quarter of an inch route of it fits you perfect. That's not gonna happen very often. So what you can do is you can use your base like this. And, and they make bases on all kinds of routers. This one just happens to be the one for this Dremel that I made. So you set it, use the quarter inch, it's close to a quarter inch, but a little over, set it at a quarter of an inch. And I always do this on a piece of scrap first till you get it just right before you try to use it on a good piece. So I'd set up a piece of scrap and I'd run this down through there and uh, make a uh, make an initial cut. And then I, I can, if it's almost there but not quite, put a piece of tape on that. If it's almost there but a pretty good ways around, stick a piece of veneer on there. And, uh, and adjust it till you get it right. And then that's all you gotta do. Just I just I did this just last week. Put some veneer in. It was a uh, just about a sixty fourth over a quarter, and I just stuck a little a couple of pieces of tape actually on there, and mm -hmm. right on it. It mean it fit just right. So all you need to do is just add a, a, some sort of filler to your uh, your fence to move it to where you want it. Could you make those, <clears throat> I guess you could make those wider than two inches if you. Oh yeah, you can make, you can make your trough however big you want to make it. I just, I just stuck on two inches. Mm -hmm. Cause two inches will make a pretty good pack of, uh, of the mirror strips. Try making one of these. Yeah. This is, the, this in, in Charleston, South Carolina, there's a famous furniture maker named um, Thomas Elf. Thomas Elf made really nice furniture in Charleston. His stuff is very valuable, or valued today. He was an English cabinet maker that came to the United States uh, as a cabinet maker who settled in, in, in Charleston and he uh, brought his English training with him. This was a popular pattern uh, in England and he brought it with him. It's a lazy eight. See that it's got sort of a lazy eight design. You cut that with a scroll saw? Yeah. And and around his chest of drawers up on the freeze around the top of the chest of drawers, this went all the way around it, up at the very top. You might think that's easy. I thought it was easy. I said, well I just cut that out. <laughs> First thing I, what I learned was when I me I measured several original chest. I measured a couple at Williamsburg and I looked online and got some dimensions. And the case width was odd. It was like 41 and 11 sixteenths. Or 40 and 3 30 seconds. It was some odd width. I said, well, why'd they do that? Well, the reason is they had this in their hand before they ever built the chest. And they built it to match this. Because that design has got to lay right on the center line of the piece. And when it turns the corner, it's got to lay right on this, this one of these others. It's got a match going around the corner. And I made the mistake of building the chest 
in then making this. Mm -hmm. So I had my pattern, and I bet you I used a ream of paper uh, in Photoshop, blowing it up. You can, you can blow it up, stretch it, you can do all kinds of things. So I blow one up, stretch it, take it down, it wouldn't fit. Go back and make another, it wouldn't fit. Finally, I got a, a unique pattern to my piece of furniture. This one fits. It matches on the center line and it turns a corner. So this, this one fits mine. That's like crown tooth molding. You yeah. cut your molding first. Yeah, that's right. But anyway, so now I know what I want to, I know what the pattern needs to be. Well, how do I cut it? All right, so I started looking in books. Let me tell you, you can't believe everything you read. Keep that in mind. You cannot believe everything you read. The Thomas Elf books that I read, and there's two or three works on, uh, uh, really good books on his works. The guy that wrote it could not have been a furniture maker. But anyway, he wrote it and he said, yeah, this this uh, this uh, molding, uh, this pierced molding, uh, was cut in the solid. In other words, it was cut into the, uh, there's no way. Because I had been to Williamsburg and stood this far from an original, original and could see where he lapped them. You could see exactly where he left them. And they were applied. They were not in the solid. Can you imagine trying to do that in the solid and clean out all of those? And this is, it was this size. You, you can't clean all that out flat. You can't do that. So I figured that guy didn't know what he was talking about. So another book. The guy says, oh, yeah. So the way they did this was they did it with carving chisels, and they glued down a thin strip of mahogany to a thicker strip of poplar. And they carved through it with a paper with a paper joint. They would have glued the mahogany strip down to a piece of poplar with paper between, it so that they could go back and take it off. And then they would go down through here and cut all this out with carbon shovels. No way. I tried that too. I don't care how sharp you make your chisel, you can't cut all this stuff. You, you can't do it. it. You can't do it without without it breaking. You just can't do that. So I said that guy didn't know what he's talking about. Much less if you could cut through that. There is no way that you could have got that off without tearing it up. I mean, those are little elements. So I said, no way that they did it that way. So I, I said, well, my, my scroll saw can handle a 9 16 inch thick piece of wood without the blade bending. So I got a piece of 9 16 thick mahogany this size, drill all a hole for all those pieces and scroll saw every one of them out. So I had a 9 16 thick piece of, maho of mahogany this long, pierced like this. Now I need to cut strips out of it. And I said, there's no way I can do that. It'll, it'll come apart. These are too, too narrow. I put a, a new uh, 3 8 inch resaw blade in the, in the saw, cut off with not a problem. Didn't break anything, just came right off. It was amazing. So now I've got, what, I think I made four, I can, which was enough for the chest. So I had four strips like this. Well, how do you put them down? How do you glue them down? And so I asked around different people about how to do it. And uh, uh, the Society of American Period Furniture Makers has an online chat room where you can ask questions. And the people that go there know what they're talking about. This guy in, uh, in, in Maine told me, he said, oh, I'll tell you exactly how to do it. He said, uh, you take a board, and he said use high glue, but I used white glue. And he said, get a piece of formica, something slick. Piece of what? Formica. Oh. And said, roll glue on it. So you got a nice even coat of glue. Take your piece you're going to, and drop it on there. Just touch it down a little. And pick it up carefully, and you'll have glue right where you need it. And then you're going to put it on the chest. He said, you need to have some mark, uh, something to mark, you know, to mark it so it stays in one spot. Put it on there, drop it, put some tape across it, and that's all you need to do. And that's what I did. No clamps. No, no clamps. Did not, did not bleed out. Just, it just, you know, I was expecting glue to ooze out everywhere. It did not. And he said, if you need, if you need to splice this, you need to cut this. I didn't have to, I had a long enough piece, but if you need to splice it, you need to come like right through here and cut it to 45 this way so that it, over, so that it overlaps. You don't, want a, you don't want a butt joint. You can see them. If you got a 45 joint, you can't see it. And when I was back at Williamsburg, I got up there again and looked at it. He spliced his. You could see. If you looked real hard, you could see. 
So that was a that was a real challenge. And I am also convinced that they that they that they had strips just like this, but they didn't make them in Charleston. I think they made them in England. I think there were people over there doing this for a living. They did them with a, a the old pedal scroll yeah. saw, and they did them on what's called an infinite scroll saw. See, I was limited on what kind of throat I had on my scroll saw, but there's a thing called an infinite scroll saw. It's a big table with a board with a with a spring mounted to the ceiling, and then a cam down here under it. They're motorized ones now, but back then they were foot driven. So you had this blade, what three or four feet long, an infinite size table. Well, you could you could scroll saw a thirty foot piece. The only thing that limited you was the walls in the room. And and I looked at uh, some old pictures. Uh, I talked to some guys at the, what's the name of that, Midwest Tool Collectors bunch. And they said, oh, yeah, so that was a that was a common tool. So they were in, a lot of them in England, not many of them in this country, but they were used for making patterns like this, scroll saw patterns. So somewhere in England, there were some guys set up to do this. If you were set up to do this all the time, you could be real efficient at it. And... Uh, and so, so they were. I think they were selling these strips. And if you go down to Charleston, I've been down there a couple of times and gone through museums. The same pattern, the same patterns on everything. Hmm. I, I think they imported. If they were buying like already made. That, I think they were. That would be why they would make that right. piece that yeah, size. Yeah, too. they had. They made the piece to fit it. Some of the pieces, some of the elf pieces, this mold, this uh, pattern, right, right around the corner. Others, they had a little post. And it went up to the post and it started on the other side. That way, you need to worry about matching. Yeah. So they had both kinds. But the same lazy eight pattern, you see it all the time. And you know where it came from? Thomas Chippendale's gentleman cabinet maker director. That's where it came from. It is a, they call it, it has, it's some sort of Chinese influence. But of all the things I've ever made, this this making that making that Charles that Thomas Elf a double chest with this molding on it, that's the hardest thing I ever did. But it worked out. And I sold it. I don't have it. <laughs> you know, I told you I had a friend I got all my wood from. His daughter wanted it, and I sold it to her. And I have regretted it ever since. I'll show you the picture. It's big, this tall, that deep, big old drawers. Got a uh, butler's drawer in it, what a butler's drawer is. Looks like a drawer, you pull it out, it drops down, it's actually a desk. It's good. It's a used book, it's out of print, but it's still available. I've, I've collected books over the years, lots of books. And I got rid of a lot of books. Because a lot of books I have, I was really interested in something back 15, 20 years, I'm not interested in anymore, I'm not gonna do that. So I sell them and get up and get rid of them and get other books. And now I've pretty well narrowed down what I'm interested in. Figured out what you're doing when you grow up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so did, we were talking earlier. Did they do? Did they do inlay on anything other than federal? Oh uh, yeah, uh, uh, they did, but it didn't come into vogue until the federal period. I mean, if you go like 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 Queen Anne or, or Hepple White, they didn't have any inlays on. Huh? None. No. So we'd be Just, wrong to put it on a Queen Anne. Oh yeah, it, that wouldn't that wouldn't be right at all. But if you're a really famous cabinet maker, you could do that and make sure you're quirky. Or <laughs> <laughs> brilliant. So oh, brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you're famous, you can get away with all kinds of stuff. 
Did y'all see that movie, uh, Bull Durham, about the baseball player? Oh, yeah. And the pitcher, you know, he, he comes in and he says, you've got, you've got shower shoes with mold on them. He said, you don't go to the majors with shower shoes with mold on them. And he said, unless you're a 20-game winner, then you can wear them and they'll say you're colorful. <laughs> Is only a small part of what this all the other features this thing has. It has a pierced fretwork up across the top. We, can we hook this up to the computer, you think? Yeah. iPad? iPhone? Yeah. You might want to see this. You want to put it on the screen up there? Yeah. Yeah. 